Dr. Martin Kaldorf, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. It's a delight. Thank you for having me. So we've, we're about a year and a half into uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And, uh, you know, we've had lockdowns. We've had uh, kind of emergence out of lockdowns right now in places uh, like where I live in New York. We're getting close. We were getting closer to some kind of semblance of normality. And now we have the Delta variant and there's discussion of lockdowns again. And we have countries that actually have been in perpetual lockdowns. And so you've described the global COVID response, and I'll quote you here, as the biggest public health fiasco in history. Feels like a, a big statement to make. Tell me more. Well, I think it is, and without doubt, uh, and for t the two sort of aspects of that. One is, while anybody can get infected by COVID, there's more than a thousandfold difference in the risk for death and the mortality risk between the oldest and the youngest. So with the naive belief that these lockdowns will protect everybody, which obviously we know now they didn't work. A lot of people uh, got COVID, a lot of people died. But there was this naive belief that that would protect the older people. And because of that, we did not implement basic public health measures to actually do what was necessary to protect those older uh, high-risk people. And because of that, many of them died unnecessarily from COVID. The other uh, aspect of it is the, uh, the collateral damage from these lockdowns. So, uh, uh, for example, children who didn't go to schools. The children are at minuscule risk from this disease in terms of mortality. They can get infected for sure, but uh, the risk from COVID for children is less than the risk from the annual influenza, which is already very low for children. So for them, this is not a risky thing. And one example is Sweden from the first wave in the spring of 2020. Sweden was the only Western country that did not close down the, all the schools. So schools and daycare were open for children ages 1 to 15. And among the 1.8 million children in Sweden during this first wave, there were exactly zero deaths from COVID. And that was without using masks, without social distancing and without any testing. If a child was sick, they were told to stay home. That was it. Uh, so this is not a serious disease for children, which we should be very grateful for. Also, young adults uh, have very low risk for mortality from, from COVID. But the collateral damage has been enormous from these lockdowns. Uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes, heart disease and so on, has been bad during this pandemic because people don't go to the hospitals or there's not... Uh, available the, the, uh, the health care that they need. Diabetes patients, for example. Uh, cancer uh, have actually gone down in 2020 and 21, but that's not because there's less cancer, it's just that we're not detecting them. And if you're not detecting them, we're not treating them either. And this is nothing that shows up in the statistics this year, uh, except to a very small extent, but uh, let's say a woman who didn't get the cervical cancer screening uh, might now uh, die three or four years from now instead of living another 15, 20 years. So this collateral damage on public health from these lockdowns is something that we're going to have to live with and, and die with for many, many years to come, unfortunately. And then, of course, there's the mental health aspects, uh, which has been enormous, uh, uh, tragic. Uh, so uh, this has really been uh, uh, an awful response to the pandemic and that goes against the basic principles of public health that we have followed for many decades. Uh, um, so um, it's very unfortunate, I think. Well, okay, so that, that's very interesting. Um, you would think that the basic principles of public health would be implemented, you know, I guess, in force in this sort of a situation. So how has that not been done? That is a very good question. Uh, to be honest, I don't know the answer to it because to me it's stunning as a public health scientist that we suddenly threw out these principles that, uh, uh, that we have sort of used for, for, uh, for decades to deal with public health issues. Uh, one is public health is about all health outcomes. It's not just about one disease like COVID. You can't just focus on COVID and then ignore everything else. 
uh, that goes against uh, how we do public health. Another thing is we have to look at it long term and not just short term. People were obsessed with the mortality for a particular month, comparing countries and so on. But what's important is not the count for a particular month, it's sort of long term overall mortality during the whole pandemic and, and, until it's over. Uh, another thing is public health is about everybody in society. And with these lockdowns, we have uh, uh, protected the Zoom class who can work from home. People like you, journalists, people like me, scientists, but also bankers, uh, attorneys, and so on. While uh, those who prepare food, uh, people in supermarkets, in the meat factories, uh, people who actually have electricity, and, and so on, uh, they have they've had to work. So uh, the burden has been put on the, the middle class and the working class. And of course, the burden has also put, put on children who uh, needs uh, education. That has long-term consequences if you don't uh, uh, give children the proper education. And schools are very, very important. And for rich people, they can put their kids in a private school or they can hire a tutor or they can afford to have one parent at home to homeschool them. Uh, that's not possible among those less affluent. So the working class children has been especially hard hit uh, by this response to the uh, pandemic. You're saying that for, I, I don't even know what, what age group it is, but you said that the effect of COVID or the, the, the risk of COVID for this young, young age group is less than that of annual influenza. I mean, that's, I don't think something that's generally known. Yeah, so I think uh, by now it's about 350 or so reported death of COVID uh, in the US for children. Uh, and we don't even know how many of those are truly COVID uh, because nobody has bothered to uh, go through all those electronic health records, which I think CDC should do. Uh, as uh, uh, Marty McCary, who is a professor at John Hopkins has been urging, uh, but that hasn't been done. So we don't know exactly how many, but it's at most 350. If we look at annual influenza, depending on, and that's for over a, uh, one and a half, basically two seasons, uh, one and a half years. Uh, if we look at annual influenza, depending on the severity uh, of the particular strain that particular year, uh, between 200 and 1,000 children die from annual influenza every year. So, of course, every death is very tragic for whether it's influenza or COVID. Uh, uh, and, of course, death of children is especially tragic. But we never closed down schools for the annual influenza. And actually, they would be actually more rational for doing that because influenza is actually spread a lot by children. So the schools and children are one of the drivers of the spread of influenza. But the opposite is true from COVID. Uh, most children who are infected get it from some adult. And uh, the children are not very good at infecting others. Uh, so it makes no sense uh, to close schools. And we saw that from other countries who have kept them open. And we should never ever close the schools, any other schools for COVID as we go forward. They should be open and we should let the children be children. And uh, education is very important and we should let them get that uh, in-person education. And we know that both teachers and, and uh, students, uh, children, I have said that online teaching is certainly not uh, even close to as good as having the personal teaching, both for education, but also for their social development and uh, hanging out with their friends. Well, so, you know, we've been hearing a lot about the Delta variant, uh, a lot of scary, frankly, headlines about the, the Delta variant. Maybe we're going to need to go back into lockdowns in the U.S., um, you know, you, you've described some of the collateral damage, some of the issues. What, what, what do you think about this, uh, this discussion that's happening now? Well, for any virus, there are going to be mutations, so there are going to be variants. And uh, some variants will be more successful than other variants in sort of spreading, to, spreading among the population. So therefore, it's not surprising that you have variants and that some variants sort of, will sort of take over. So this is not at all surprising. Uh, the Delta variant may be somewhat more contagious, but uh, that's not the game changer. The, what would be a game changer is if you got a variant that started to kill young people, 
zodiacal children, and the uh, and the delta vein is not doing that. Uh, what would also be uh, unfortunate is if you have a variant so that the natural immunity uh, that you have for, uh, from COVID uh, or from vaccine doesn't work with the variant. But uh, uh, we know that if you've had COVID, you have very good immunity, not, uh, not only for, for the same variant, but also for other variants and even for other types of sort of cross immunity to other types of uh, uh, coronaviruses. So we know, for example, that if you had uh, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, you are, have also have immunity to SARS-CoV-1, uh, which we had earlier, uh, many years ago, a few years ago. Uh, and it also provides protective immunity to the other four common coronaviruses that are endemic, uh, that, that we've all been exposed to and we will continue to be exposed to. So uh, I don't see any, any problem with the Delta variants or any other variants that that sort of changes uh, anything. It's not a game changer. And the best approach is to uh, make sure that all old people get vaccinated uh, to protect them. And then we should not have lockdowns. Uh, we should let uh, people live their uh, normal lives. And if there are an old person who hasn't been vaccinated, they should get it and then wait two weeks. And after two weeks after vaccinations, mm -hmm. they are protected and they can uh, also participate in society. But until they are vaccinated, of course, old people need to be very careful. So I want to talk about natural immunity in a moment. This is very important because uh, there's been a lot of different messaging, frankly, about that. But before we go there, you know, in places like Florida and Louisiana, for example, right now, there's a surge in cases. Your thoughts? So it's important to differentiate cases and mortality. So the fact that somebody tests positive is not necessarily a, a worry. And it's something that we would expect and it's something that's going to continue to happen because as, as COVID-19 becomes endemic, people are going to be infected. Uh, if you test them, they're going to test positive. And they might even have the virus replicate before the immune system uh, sort of kicks in. And they could even maybe some of them might even spread it. But as long as people are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, this is nothing we should worry about. So what we do have to worry about is the mortality and also hospitalizations. The benefit of being immune, whether it's because you had COVID or because you're vaccinated, is not to avoid being infected and test positive. That's going to happen. The key thing is if you, if you have had COVID already or if you are vaccinated, that protects you against severe disease and mortality and death. And we can see that cases and mortality has sort of started to decouple now. So for example, in the UK, uh, there was a wave that peaked in the what mid July of, of cases. It was a very sharp increase and now it's going sharply down. Uh, for mortality, it's just a tiny blip. So this is a contrast to before the vaccines, before focus protection, when cases rose and then mortality also rose, sort of in parallel. But that has sort of been the vaccines and the immunity from people who have had COVID is sort of decoupling that. We can see it in Sweden, which had uh, the first wave and the second wave, there were increasing cases and there was also an increase in, uh, in, in mortality uh, corresponding to that. But then there was a third wave that peaked in April, there was a third wave of cases, but uh, mortality kept just going down. And it now has been close to zero for, for, uh, for more than a month. So uh, also there was a decoupling. And that was actually the Delta variant that was the third wave. That was predominantly uh, the Delta variant was increasing proportion of those in the third wave of those cases. So but it decoupled the cases and, and, uh, and death. And we see the same thing here in the US now in the summer wave that uh, we see in the southern state. There has been quite a few increasing cases, but the mortality, there's a blip because not everybody is vaccinated, not everybody has had a disease, so not everybody's immune, so there's a little bit of a blip. But uh, uh, we don't see the same close correspondence between cases and death as we've done in the past. So that's a very positive thing and a very good thing. And it kind of shows that we are on our way from 
the pandemic phase to the endemic phase. And we will always have COVID-19 with us. It's not going to go away. We can't eradicate a virus like this. So it will always be with us. But uh, when people get it exposed for the second time or third time or fourth time, the immune system helps making sure that it's not a serious illness or leads to death. And of course, new people are born every year and they are susceptible, they haven't had it. So when children are born, um, they don't have the immunity to this particular virus, but we know that it's very mild for children. So this is a very good thing that this virus is not harsh on children when they get it them the first time. And as long as they get it the first time when they are a child, if they somehow try to stay away from it until they get 80, and haven't been exposed to it, will be impossible. But if you could do that, then of course, when they're 80 and susceptible, they would have be of high risk. But as long as they're, they're exposed as a child, their immune system will sort of build up and then the next time um, they will be protected with the immune system. Mm -hmm.